I'd like to call the April 4th meeting of the Board of Education to order. Um, in front of you, you should have the m minutes from our March 21st meeting. And if you have a minute, if you could uh, take a look and if someone's ready to make a motion to approve those minutes. Penny? So moved. A second? Sherry? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Um, moving on to the agenda. Um, could I get a motion to, well, if you could review the agenda, and if I could get a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Uh, Jen? Second? Brendan? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. That's unanimous. Um, Moving on to comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes will be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. Do I have anyone who'd like to speak this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to reports and recognition. Um, the first item on our agenda is the SACS remediation update with Ms. Valancourt. All right, if I could say a word or two to introduce, and um, Dr. Keating, you're welcome to jump in as well. Um, but as I'm sure you recall, last year as the SACS Auditorium Committee was, uh, was forming and was beginning to look at the work over at SACS, um, there was some testing done, some preliminary testing for asbestos, lead, and PCBs. And we found the PCBs in the auditorium, and as a result of those tests, spun off a committee uh, and that was specifically to look at the remediation and to manage the remediation work that needed to be done in the auditorium and some other spots. Um, the, what we found in that initial test led us to close the auditorium, as you recall, um, which the, again, I want to say the Visual Performing Arts Department has done an outstanding job with that auditorium closed, moving their performances around and making everything work. As a matter of fact, The Little Mermaid this weekend was a, another enormous success for our kids that if you didn't notice the main office on the way in. You can see the under the sea um, window <laughs> decoration there, how, how wonderful it all looks. So they've done a great job, but it has been tough. And I know Mr. Macedo has had to be a wizard over there to uh, make all the scheduling work. But the SACS Remediation Committee has continued to do its work since those initial tests. And uh, Amy has been with us really even before we got into SACS. She was with us over at South uh, where we had our window project. And you may recall, she. Amy presenting to the Board of Education earlier, has also presented to our parents. Last year, we had an update to our parents over at South and over at SACS uh, about the auditorium, and Amy came and presented to parents and faculty, shared information with everyone, was able to answer questions. So we're fortunate to have Amy with us again tonight to sort of catch us up on where we are with the SACS Auditorium Committee and the work that's going on and share some good news along the way about some approvals and things that we've been working very hard and Amy's been working harder than anybody to achieve so that we can um, get the work completed that needs to be done in preparation for the SACS Building Committee work that is queued up and uh, all interconnected. So, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. I'm always happy working on the New Canaan Public Schools projects. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about SACS and about the renovation project, um, the auditorium, uh, sort of bring you about, you know, where we were um, last year and where we are now and where we're going forward. So again, my name's Amy Valancourt. I'm a licensed environmental professional with Tie and Bond. I am afraid to say I have uh, 20 years experience doing this. And so I'm gonna start off with a summary. Uh, where we were in December 2014, we were doing our inspection for the auditorium renovation project. Um, as Brian indicated, we identified PCBs, and I'll get into uh, greater detail in the next slides, mostly focused around paints and caulks. Um, the uh, New Canaan Public Schools had elected to close the auditorium just to be protective. There was no requirement for us to close the auditorium, but we wanted to be protective. We knew that we were moving forward with a remediation project. Um, and so that's where we were in December 2014. Moving forward with the project in March of 2015 is when we notified EPA and 
our Connecticut Department of Environmental Energy and Environmental Protection of the PCBs that we identified and the intent that we were going in to remove all the PCBs that were identified. In May 2015, we are in front of the Office of School Construction Grants for the state and we received approval uh, to go out for bidding and funding for the project. We did proceed with abatement for the auditorium in the summer of 2015. Um, we had removed the PCB containing paints from the auditorium, some door caulking. The paint that was on the auditorium floor, we also looked in other areas of the school because we knew it had PCBs. So Bob Willoughby and I did an intensive search through the school, where else is this marine gray paint from the 1950s? We did find it in two other areas, the ceramics room and the boiler room. So we added those to the auditorium renovation project, again, to be protective. If we knew it had PCBs, we were taking it out. Now, the ceramics room, it, during our abatement in 2015, we knew it had to be open to the um, students come when the school year started. And knowing what we were going through with the auditorium and removing the paint and do, um, going in front of the state and EPA for encapsulation, we encapsulated the ceramics room with the same uh, epoxy sealant that we are promoting for the auditorium. Um, one exciting thing there, it served as a little bit of a pilot project for us. You know, it's used in other schools, but we needed to put it down on the floor. And in fact, um, we were able to show that the encapsulation of that was successful in controlling PCB impacts um, in the underlying concrete. And we did wipe samples and air samples following the project, and everything came back non detect. So we are pushing forward to use the same method in the auditorium. And then December of 2015, we submitted this elaborate plan to EPA and DEEP uh, for the encapsulation of these residual PCB impacts that we had to <coughs> floors and walls. And now I'm going to get into some technical detail a little bit about the PCBs and the impacts to concrete. And if I'm too technical or anybody has a question, don't be afraid to go ahead and raise your hand. I want to provide clarification as we go. So this next slide, I divided this slide into PCBs that were detected less than 50 parts per million and PCBs that were detected over 50 parts per million. And that's significant because above 50 parts per million is really the federal level. We're kind of an island here in Connecticut where we have our own state regulations for PCBs and they don't default to the federal 50 part per million like New York or Massachusetts. In Connecticut, because we already had a standard established at one part per million for PCBs, which was a residential standard for soil, they apply it to building materials. So we categorized everything that we sampled that had PCBs. And what was detected above 50 parts per million, that was in the federal level, was black paint along the back of the stage. Gray paint, as I explained on the auditorium floor. We had it in the mezzanine stairwell going up to the, um, what do they call that little room? Projector room. And the ceramics room, boiler room floor, as I explained. Uh, previously. And then we had a little portion of metal duct in the auditorium mechanical room, and only the bottom portion of that duct had paint on it, a tan paint. That tan paint came over 50 parts per million. All the other stuff that we detected that had PCBs was below 50 parts per million. So if we didn't have the state standard, we really wouldn't have to address those we would have to deal with the above 50, but here in Connecticut, anything above one part per million, we're required to take out. That's the way the law is regulated. So moving forward, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we did in the 2015 abatement project during the summer. 
The work was performed by Standard Demolition Services. They were awarded the bid. We had a competitive bid process. We had a lot of contractors bid. Um, Standard was awarded the bid, and Time Bond uh, performed the monitoring. We also wrote the bid specs for the project, um, which guided Standard on their removal procedures, their disposal. And um, the scope of work included removal of all the PCB containing materials detected in the auditorium, the mezzanine stairwell, the mechanical room, removal of the paint from the ceramics room floor, and as I said, we jumped ahead and encapsulated because we needed to use that room and we wanted to show that this encapsulation was gonna work for this application. It, um, we did a lot of research to actually pick the encapsulant. Uh, EPA had done studies over years of various encapsulants and their wearability and their ability to uh, protect from um, PCBs off-gassing or leaching. And this is one that came highly recommended for durability and a number of things. Um, following the abatement project, we had done confirmatory sampling. So when I tell you the hundreds of confirmatory samples, we had set up a five-foot grid on anything that needed to be sampled. So picture the auditorium floor. You know, it's a lot bigger than this room and collecting a sample every five feet and that's what we did on floors and walls we needed to tell EPA what we were leaving behind we tried we scarified all of the paint off we had even gone down by layers we kept doing bead blasting trying to remove layers trying to get down below one part per million the problem with concrete on floors and walls is that it's very porous and so those little nooks and crannies tend to absorb the PCBs in low levels. And that's what we were dealing with when we did these confirmatory samples. Some of the other challenges we came up with, with the 2015 abatement, we had three change orders from standard demolition. The main bulk of the, tr the, main bulk of the change orders resulted from the fact of when we took down the sheetrock ceiling, which had low level PCB on the white, uh, white paint, that was a fixed ceiling. And when we took it down, there were a couple things behind it that we found. One was asbestos transite panel. It had been entirely enclosed. There was no way to see it prior to taking the ceiling down. And when we took the ceiling down, we found that there was a significant amount of dust above the ceiling. So it was on beams, it was on the wood framing, it was on every surface up there. So to be um, very protective, we tested the dust, we wipe sampled it, and we did get PCBs. Low levels, but we still got PCBs. So it resulted in removing of all the wood framing, them cleaning all that dust on every surface. Um, some of the issue we ran into was the HVAC duct was running up there. Now we could take the time to have standard clean it off, and then we would have to go take our many wipe samples to show the entire duct was clean, or what we showed through a feasibility uh, analysis is that it was much cheaper, faster, easier, easier for us to just take out all the HVAC duct and dispose of it along with the wood framing as PCB impacted material. So we proceeded in that fashion. Also the ceramics room, when we bead blasted down and bead blasted down to try to get all the PCBs out, it's, it was a floor poured in the 1950s. We had cracks, we had crevices, it was very uneven, pitted. So we required in order to get a good seal with the encapsulant, they had to fill all the cracks and they had to put a leveling compound across. Um, so um, that was resulting from mostly change order one. Change order two, we had wood panels that went along the walls of the auditorium. When we were dealing with the PCB dust and looking at removing other components that were in the auditorium, like we had the fiberboard along the back of the wall that had teal paint on it. 
Now, when we did our inspection, we had pulled back corners of the wood panels to see if there was anything behind it, but really to get a good look, we needed to pull off the panels. So since we were already in total demo mode, taking out everything from the dust above the ceiling, we had them pull the panels too. It was prudent to do it at the time. We had everything under containment. It wouldn't uh, have been cost effective to go back and do that. So the last change order was disposal of all those materials. So your first change order was removal, your first and second, and then there was a change order, a third change order for disposal as PCB waste. Now, all of that work added on to tie-in bonds um, contract also because we were doing additional monitoring. We had not only moved to 10, 12-hour days, we moved into Saturdays and holidays and anything over the summer um, just to get the work done by the end of the year. Additional contractor administration and additional sampling. After they cleaned all the dust above the ceiling, we had to then go and take wipe samples to make sure that everything was clean up there. Now with the 2015 abatement, after we went, and again our intent was to go remove all the PCBs. So we have concrete block walls along the back of the stage in the mezzanine stairwell um, in the mechanical room. And to grind those paints and scarify off the concrete, you can only go so far on a concrete block before you start to affect the integrity of the wall. So we got to that point doing the walls. Now the floor, we had cored, core sampled down through the auditorium floor and we knew there were impacts two inches deep where this paint had absorbed into the concrete. We had removed about a half an inch off of the floor and there was no way we were gonna go down any farther seeing the floor was only four inches deep. How could we remove two with that entire structure over this floor? The integrity would be compromised. So in doing our work, not being able to get PCB impacts below one, that then forced us to go to EPA and Department of Energy and Environmental Protection and say we'd like to encapsulate all of these surfaces where we have remaining PCB impacts. So that was really the, the crux of what we've been doing for the last you know, year, uh, you know, definitely the last four or five months working intensely with them to develop this plan. And so this slide at the end shows you what the resulting impacts were from all those samples we took at five foot intervals. And this is what we ended up with. So the auditorium floor where we started with 4,200 parts per million in the paint, we were able to get it down to 1.0 to 15 parts per million. Now that's 150 samples fall within that range. <coughs> we had one sample that had a 59. So the ceramics room floor, similar, you know, we had 30, maybe 40 samples between the ceramics room floor and the kiln room. We were left with 1.3 to 8.7 parts per million with one sample at a 20 part per million. Now, we already know with the ceramics room floor because we encapsulate it and then we did wipe samples after encapsulation mm -hmm. and we did air samples in there that our encapsulation successfully achieved none detect for PCBs in that room with those concentrations. Stage wall also 2.4 to 6.9 at about 40 or 50 samples. Auditorium mechanical room wall, same thing. You know, 1.9 to 4.5 with one sample at 17 parts per million. Now, the mezzanine stairwell floor was very difficult to do removal. We're doing removal on the stairs and they have metal treads in there. So not only are we trying to grind down the concrete, in between those metal treads, we're trying to needle scale. Looks like a little tattoo machine shooting out <laughs> little beads of sand, you know. We're, we're trying to get the little nitty gritty. And then when we go and we sample, we have from a 4.5 to 280. We had a, one sample that was 280, one sample that was 170. So in working with EPA and DEEP, they have asked us to go back and do additional removal. Fine, we've put it into the 2016 abatement. 
we will try to get down another eighth to a quarter of an inch. If we need to grind down, you know, cut out the metal stair treads, we will. We're working with the architect. He'll tell us, you know, what he's going to do for overlay on that. Um, but as far as the removal, we're going to go remove. And then we're going to resample and we're going to go back to EPA and say, this is what we got it down to. And if it's within the range that's acceptable for them, they're going to let us encapsulate. So as I said, we went through this long process of developing this encapsulation plan. And on March 29th, very recently, we got approved. And so we're using this SikaGuard 62 epoxy sealant. And it's really like an epoxy paint. It's thick, though. Um, in our approval, there were conditions added to it. EPA and DEEP wanted to see certain things like additional removal of the concrete from the mezzanine stairwell. They also <coughs> wanted, we had done some removal of tan paint um, related to putting in new doors to the auditorium. So we removed some tan paint in the corridor in the hallway behind. But they want to do removal of all the paint on that wall. So we're including it in this. If, and again, this is a concrete block wall, we're going to remove the paint. We're going to grind down as much as we can. And we already know with these concrete block walls, you can't go more than a quarter of an inch before you start compromising. So to be um, proactive, when we prepared this encapsulation plan, we said we're going to go in and do the additional removal, but we're going to be looking at it. If we need to encapsulate, we want to include in the encapsulation plan. And they approved that. Um, the boiler room. We had that gray paint on the floor, and it is also on the walls, a different shade of gray. I don't think it was the original, I call it U-boat marine gray, but there is a green gray paint on the walls of the boiler room. EPA and DEEP, since we're doing the floor, want us to remove the paint from the walls in the boiler room. We said we would. Another thing EPA came back with is they asked if there was a sump in the boiler room, and I said, yes, there's a sump. And they asked if we had evaluated the sump to see if PCBs had leached from the gray paint on the floor into the sump. I said I would. I will sample the sump to see if there's PCBs. If we detect PCBs, we will go clean that sump. So we added it into the plan. We had previously in our 2014 inspection saw a little bit of fire caulk above a ceiling in one room that was initially going to be included in the auditorium renovation project. Um, we had not removed that when we were doing the abatement for the auditorium, but when we go back in for the 2016 summer, we will be removing that fire caulk. Um, it's about this much. And then we have door caulk on a couple of the rooms that, again, tested under 50. All of these materials, except for that gray paint, that was on the auditorium floor, boiler room floor. All were under 50, but EPA and DEP are asking us to go in and do this removal. If we're going in and removing it, they want us to, to do everything that we have in that um, area. So we're doing the fire stop caulk and the door caulk in the rooms to, under this encapsulation plan. And then two other things that EPA wanted us to include in the plan is public outreach. They want us to go out and, and show people where we are and what we're doing, and that's fine. We've been doing that all along. So we're calling it continued public outreach. Um, and indeed, notice, any time, it's written into the regulation that any time you're leaving something um, and encapsulating it, you need to get a deed notice. You know, things change over time. There's new people on the board. There's new people in, you know, New Canaan Public Schools offices. They want it on the deed that for this property there's encapsulated PCBs so that you don't five years, ten years from now decide to demo the school and not even know about it. There's also a requirement for O&M for the encapsulated areas. And so annually, and this is training that um, we'll be doing with um, New Canaan Public Schools facilities personnel. Yep. 
Can you explain what an O&M is? Yes, I'm sorry. Operations and maintenance. See, I told you it's, it's those little <laughs> technical well. jargons, and I go right <laughs> over them. Um, so operation and maintenance plan, and what that means is that annually, somebody has to go visually inspect these surfaces and make sure there's no cracks, there's no peeling, nothing's been disturbed, and then I come in or someone like me comes in and we wipe sample, collect a wipe sample from the encapsulated surfaces so we can show it's still effective, it's still doing what it's supposed to do. Now, part of the O&M is what if. So what if there's a crack? And that O&M is written to say what has to be done to repair that. So what has to be done to repair the surface? If you wipe sample it and you get a detection, what has to be done immediately to that area, that wall, to deal with this? So now we're into our new abatement in 2016, the summer. So we're going to complete the removal of all the things I just talked about that are included in the encapsulation plan. <clears throat> we are also, besides the removal, we're going to encapsulate, we're going to do our encapsulation now that we have approval on the auditorium, on the boiler room once we remove the paint, and these are floors, and the mezzanine stairwell floor once we finish grinding off another quarter of an inch. On the walls, we have the back of the stage wall, and we have the auditorium mechanical room wall where we had removed paint in there. Um, those will also be encapsulated, and they've already been approved. Potential encapsulation. Now, the walls in the boiler room, the walls in the mezzanine stairwell, and the corridor behind the stage are something that EPA and DEEP are looking for us to go in and do the removal now. And we're going to approach it very similar to how we did it previously, is my intent is to go in and, and scarify as much as I can and try to get down to less than one part per million so we don't have to encapsulate but I've written it into the plan that if we cannot achieve that, then we will encapsulate. I want to tell you just quickly about um, what the alternative is to encapsulation and what we had to go through with EPA and DEEP and talk about. If you, it's either encapsulate or remove the wall, remove the floor. Take out all of the auditorium concrete floor. Take out your ceramics room floor take down your walls and your corridor. So you're not the first to travel down this road. There are many um, examples, even here in Connecticut, where schools have gone under this approach um, to encapsulate low-level PCBs. And we will evaluate the sump and we'll clean it if necessary. Now, following all of this work in 2016, we're gonna do just like we did in 2015. It's five-foot grid sampling along every surface, wipe samples of everything we encapsulate, and of course, just like we did previously, air sampling. That's the key for me for reoccupancy. There are standards set by EPA that I have to follow, and we air sample for reoccupancy. If we don't have a situation where we can um, go ahead and encapsulate, if we have you know, dust in the air, the contractor is prepared, and we write it into the specs, that they clean again and clean again until we achieve that criteria. And outside of the auditorium renovation project, we're embarking on a new addition renovation for SAC school. And so I've prepared bid specs for this one also. And we are going in to manage all of the painted surfaces and caulking compounds that we encounter as PCB containing materials. We're going and we're going to manage everything under full containment. Anything that we're going to impact, we're removing. And we're including baseline, before we actually do the removal, we're doing baseline air sampling and wipe sampling. We'll conduct the removal of all the materials under full containment. And following our abatement, we're going to do the same thing. Dust samples, wipe samples, um, in the air samples. This was something we did with the 2015 renovation. We put it in front of EPA and DEEP, and we got approval for it. So we're proceeding under the same plan for the 2016 abatement. 
And then I gave some informational sources so you guys wouldn't feel alone, like you were the only one embarking on this, because you're not. <laughs> I'm doing five of these right now. <laughs> and so if you have any questions, I will take them. Okay. Well, I wanted to thank you, uh, Amy, for um, giving us such a detailed update on what you're doing. I'm really impressed with the level of um, you know, uh, care that you're taking with, with the building. So um, I'm sure there's lots of questions, so let me open it up to the board for questions and let's see if anybody has any, anybody have any questions? Come on. Okay, Jen. Good. Yeah. Um, so I want to reiterate what she said. Thank you very much. Like it's very, you know, this is definitely having kids in the schools. Everyone's very concerned. And so the fact that you're doing all these air samples and um, all these testing makes everyone just, you know, make sure that our kids are safe. Um, as far as, you might have mentioned this, but as far as timing, like I know we're having another presentation after this, but like, where are you in this process? So you just got, on March 29th, you're able to encapsulate, and you're doing all these air tests. Like, how, I mean, I guess you really can't say for sure, time-wise, like, where you are in this whole process. Like, is it going to be done by June, or? So we are embarking on the next phase of abatement. I don't want to say, you know, it, we actually had to do the auditorium renovation in two years. Um, so where we are right now in the time frame is that the day the kids get out of school, we're going to be in there setting up ready to do the abatement. Okay. So I know. So you were working on it last summer, and then you're doing it again this summer. Right. Right. So, okay. Did I right. answer your question? Um, I guess. No, I guess. I just, I'm wondering, I guess I'll hear more later as to like the... Well, well I'll, I'll address the impact okay. on the SACS Building Committee project. Okay. Sure, how they dovetail. Sure. Okay. Other questions? That's why you wanted me to stay for your That's presentation, right. yeah. Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Maria? Um, what's the uh, life of an encapsulated surface? And does anything accelerate its um, life, I guess? You know, make it so that you do your O&M checkup and there's yep. a problem. So... I'm going to say this, although I don't have it in front of me, but I believe EPA in their study that we are reviewing about the encapsulants, they did it over a 10-year period. So I have good confidence that the Sikogard 62 for 10 years um, by itself is effective. Not that in 10 years it's up, but that's what the study is. Now, Keep in mind annually, we're going and checking that encapsulant for any kind of crack, wear, tear, and that does impact how good the encapsulant is for how long, is the wear and tear. So when you're talking about floors, we're doing multiple layers, and then there is another surface over that, a finished surface. So let's say, you know, we're in the auditorium, I don't, I think they're putting carpet over, you know, in the areas in the, uh, the walkways like they had before. So we don't expect where to be on there. You know, they're looking when they go to do their O&M for pieces of the carpet pulled up or missing pieces, something that would then create a wear on the encapsulant. So how long does it last for? Well based on the data and what EPA provided in their white paper, we're looking at you know 10 years for at least what they predicted. Could be 20 years, could be 25 years. It's hard to say because PCBs is a new animal. So they've only been using this encapsulant, let's say 10 years, and that's why they were able to study it. So I can't really predict but I'm as good as the data that I read. Um, I have a good feeling that with all the surfaces over it, we're not going to see any, you know, real issue with the wear and tear because we have carpet or we have flooring. On the walls, we'll have to look and see if there's any bare walls and it's just encapsulant and we have paint. You know, what's the wear on that? So it's an annual thing that you have to stay up with. Thank you. Yeah, so I just said one more, just follow up on that for the encapsulation. Yeah. Since it is a new uh, procedure, I, I guess because PCBs are a new thing, 
Is there a thought in terms of the process that there is supposed to be a retreatment at some particular point, or that's not even known? No, it's part of the operation in maintenance plan, the O&M plan. When this is written, it's written as if you go into a room and you're uh, visually um, looking at the encapsulant and you see a crack in the encapsulant. You know, this has to be noted and then it has to be wipe sampled and then it has to be re-encapsulated if that's the case. So you can put multiple layers of encapsulant and that would be the plan if you wipe sample and you have PCB come to the surface, it's encapsulant over that. Anyone else? I, I had a question um, about the, um, the mezzanine stairs. Um, so you mentioned that the, um, it's, I guess the DEP, the Connecticut DEP, um, makes you get below that 50 parts per million, and we had difficulty getting to that level on certain areas. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, Connecticut DEP wants you to get to below one part per million. Right. So, um, and we had difficulty in certain areas getting below that, so that's that's why we are pursuing the encapsulation. And, and um, did they give you a range at which you were allowed to encapsulate. So I see that you know they're making you go back to the mezzanine stairs um, because we didn't get below a certain level. Right? Like, did they give you a level below which they can? They didn't. But in my experience, if you can achieve under a hundred okay. parts per million, they are more amenable to caps encapsulation. Okay. Yeah. So so those mezzanine stairs, I have to go back to. What I had the, a 280 okay, and so, a 170. Okay, so with those stairs, I mean, how confident are you that with your going back to the that you'll be able to get under the 100? And if you can't, what does that do to the... Okay, so I look at it like I have no choice, right? right? Which makes <laughs> it a bad spot for the contractor, right, right. right? Put somebody in there for three days and leave them in there. <laughs> um, that's the approach I take. Okay. Now... Throughout this process, all, our alternative, if you can't get it out, take the whole thing out. So I'm either faced with contractor get it down below or architect help me figure out how we're going to demo all these stairs and pour brand new stairs. Okay. Right? Okay. So a little bit between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We have to get it done. Uh, yeah, we have to get it done, so we have to do the right, right. thing. Right, get it done. I mean, that, we have to get it done. Yeah. That really is my middle name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions for Amy? It was very thorough. I really, you know, I mean, I'm going to have to go to these websites, I think, just to, mm -hmm. to understand a little bit more, but um, it's, uh, you got a lot, you got a big project. Yeah. Big project, so mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And as we do, so you know, the, the presentation itself will be on our website, as will Penny's presentation and Jill's presentation after that, um, under the current Board of Education meeting docs. And then we archive them there as well. So if anyone's interested in pulling that up, certainly welcome to do so. Okay. Yes. And as you can tell, we are very fortunate to have Amy as part of our team. Yeah, we are. Um, so the next item on our reports and recognition is the Sachs Building Project Update with Ms. Ration. Thank you, Penny. Um, oh. Well, Penny needs no interruption. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of good fortune, um, Penny and Jim Bell together have been spearheading our Sachs Building Committee uh, since its inception back in August of 2014. And <laughs> he's shaking his head. Um, yeah. It has been a full-time job, I think, ever since, and we are in a wonderful place, I think, at this point. Always more work to do and always more questions to have answered, but um, Penny and Jim wanted to share with the board an uh, update sort of on where we are at this point uh, with the understanding that as probably in about two months, there'll be prob a more detailed update, I would, I would right. anticipate. This is, we thought uh, um, it was appropriate at this point uh, to kind of come back and give you all a uh, first quarter update on what we've achieved. Uh, in the SACS Building Committee. I just want to uh, recognize uh, Ken Campbell, who's another committee member who uh, came out today. So thank you to the entire committee. So basically our financing uh, was finalized uh, on January 4th. 
Uh, all, that was when all the time periods uh, when someone could challenge it ran out. Uh, construction drawings for the SACS uh, Building Committee project additions and renovation were approved uh, first by the SACS Building Committee and then by the Board of Education on February 4th, and we appreciated your holding a special meeting on that day to, to uh, look at those plans. On February 10th, we had um, the uh, next step with the State Office of School Construction Grants because we're receiving approximately uh, a little bit over $2 million in uh, uh, money back from the state for this project, we estimate. So we held the pre-bid review conference with them. At that conference, they informed us um, that we were in good shape on the SACS Building Committee project. We had a, number of, a couple of uh, loose ends and items to finish up to work on, but that they also wanted to have the EPA approval uh, from the uh, SACS Auditorium Remediation uh, Committee work before they would approve us to go out to bid uh, on the SACS uh, Building Committee. So we were a little bit uh, waiting. Uh, we had a couple things to finish up in February, but we've been waiting in March to get the approval from the EPA uh, on the uh, auditorium plan. And you know, it just those things just are a process. They were going back and forth and working very diligently, but it took some time. So we were really thrilled when uh, the approval came in on March 29th. I think we got it at 11 a.m. and sent it to the state at 1 p.m. <laughs> so they have had it now, and what our next stage on the SACS Building Committee is we're waiting for the state to um, give us approval to bid. Now, Gary Trombley, who's with the state uh, DEEP, uh, was in on all the conversations with the EPA and tie and bond. So we're not expecting any surprises, but we're still uh, uh, waiting um, for that approval from the state to come through. So we have... Uh, our construction manager has prepared the project to go out to bid. So we're expecting to do that, to go out to bid in April, to get the contracts uh, back uh, in May and June. There'll be about 20 bid, different bid packages, I think 20 some odd bid packages that go and get bid out. We'll give an update to the parents and the staff, and we'll come back to the Board of Ed if you want us to, if it's a good idea, on the construction plans sometime before school is out in the spring of 2016. Uh, we plan to start construction in June of 2016. Because we've had this slight delay uh, while we're waiting for the EPA approval, we're not expecting now to finish the uh, new addition in full in August of 2017. Uh, it's going to be delivered uh, uh, in two stages, the second stage of which we expect will be at the end of October of 2017. So the big questions are what happens to the schedule and what's the cost impact? So at this point, um, the delay uh, in going out to bid is going to create some additional costs. Uh, there'll be maybe one or two extra months of general conditions, and we'll have to shift some of the work uh, to avoid win winter conditions. However, based on the current schedule, which uh, has us receiving approval to bid by April 15th, it's um, our uh, professional's opinion that these additional costs should be contained within the um, current project budget of $18.6 million that we have. So this last schedule is sort of the new project schedule, and we thought we'd give you kind of a, a, a review of it in block format. Uh, so awarding contracts, uh, May and June, the doing the classroom edition uh, starting uh, in uh, July, or, or actually when school is out, and then finishing in October. We're expecting now to do a two-stage delivery. They're going to um, uh, turn over part of the first floor for the start of school so that we can swing uh, the new arts, the students in the art classes into that new space. That gives us a little bit more time to finish up the music um, VPA renovations. The auditorium renovation will start as soon as we are clear with the re additional remediation that has to happen. So we expect that to, ha we'll have to figure out the exact timing, we expect that construction to start sometime in the summer of 2016 and it'll go uh, forward and we, we're hoping to have the auditorium back in session, uh, back in use uh, by about the end of the school year 2017. The music and VPA room renovations will start um, at the end of, after school ends uh, next school year, so June of 2017, 
and they will uh, be completed uh, by uh, end of October 2017. So we've gone over this new schedule with Greg uh, in detail, and we will be able to deliver the entire program because, as you know, in the fall of 2017, we'll have the auditorium back in service. So we can use that uh, for choir or band as we need while we might be finishing up the other rooms. So that's, um, that's basically, oops, that's our update. And any questions? Okay. Well, thank you again, Penny. Let's, uh, let's open it up. Sherry, sorry. So Penny and Jim and Ken in the committee, thank you so much for your continued full-time effort. Um, I don't know if this will come to, if you can answer this now or if this will be your next presentation, but can you just exp uh, kind of give us a sense of how you're going to manage the safety and the distraction of the construction while school is in session? Ah, we have had, uh, th we've had lots of discussions with ONG on that. I think that's the uh, presentation that I, I mentioned. We're, we'll bring in ONG and they'll answer uh, specifically all of your questions about that. But they are the largest uh, uh, company that does school construction in Connecticut. So they are well experienced with managing it and have some good plans for how to do mm -hmm. that. And it's standard for them to be doing the construction while school in session. While in session, yes. So they have standard protocols for that. And Absolutely standard protocols. There'll be good separation of the workers and the students. Um, there'll be some shields that go up as needed. Uh, because, you know, they're working in somewhat close proximity for the addition. So the, they are uh, fully aware of that and are developing uh, detailed plans. Okay. And just one other question. I obviously know the delay was out of your hands, out of your control. but. Is, is there any way that we can look at, you know, getting that open before the opening school day of 2017? I mean, I just, I would assume by that point to go into yet another school year is going to be met with exhaustion by the teachers and students and everyone. And I mean, have we looked at the cost benefit of overtime of any at, other options of making up we that did. last we time? Looked, we looked at if we worked every Saturday. Uh, and if we worked every Saturday, that actually was going to... Uh, we were not going to be able to deliver the renovation and addition project within the project budget. So we didn't think that that was a good way to do. As we go through the uh, construction, we will look for every effort to speed it up as much as we can. I mean, we haven't given that up as a possibility, but we wanted the community to be aware that the uh, full uh, addition would not, might not be ready until uh, October of 2017. Right. Thank you. The, the plan, though, is to turn over at least part of the addition at the start of 2017. Yeah, the current correct? plan is to turn over. What we want to do is we want to be able to have the art rooms. The, the, new, the current art rooms are being turned into the new choral room. So we want to start the work on the choral room as soon as the students are out in June of 2017. And if that, uh, so we'll, we'll be able to do that. And to be able to do that, uh, if we're not going to finish it uh, in Sept by September 2017, we have to put the art program somewhere. So we will have uh, at least three rooms in which to put the uh, art, uh, those art classes in the new edition in September of 2017. Great. Thank you, Penny. Brendan? I was going to ask kind of the opposite question, which is, is there any cushion in the timeline at all? Or is this an aggressive timeline, conservative? How do you think about it? I, middle of the road. I would say this is the middle of the road. I, I have hope that we can move it forward, but I'm not going to promise anything. And then since this is renovation in part, you always get surprises. Right. So. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question. So, um, and I'm happy that Amy's still here. So in your last presentation, you mentioned that you're going to be um, proceeding with demolition in the new expansion and renovation section as if everything you um, remove could possibly have PCBs or asbestos? Is that, I just want to make sure I understood that. Yes. Um, PCBs. Do you want to come to the yeah. microphone just because the sure. things are televised, so. Yes, so we're moving forward um, addressing materials, assuming that it has PCBs. We want to get in, grab all the materials, get out, so they can get on with their work. And we think that's the um, 
most cost-effective, time-effective way to proceed. So that's how we plan on going. As far as asbestos goes, um, there we had done an inspection um, in there and sampled materials for asbestos. And other than some pipe insulation that we had above a ceiling, um, we did not find materials that had asbestos. But there were a couple things going into this renovation addition we're assuming ahead of time. We did not want to do any selective demo while the kids were there. So we did not pull off a chalkboard to look for glue dabs behind. But the minute the kids are out of school and we're in there setting up, we're going to sample those materials that we were not able to sample during the school year. Another material along that similar line is the roofing. They're going to be tying in the roof for the new addition renovation, so we need to go sample that roofing material. But we didn't want to make a hole in the roof in case it leaked while the kids are in the school. So we're gonna wait the day they're out, we're gonna go test those suspect asbestos materials. So if, if you, after the kids are out and you test the suspect materials and we find some contaminant, um, do you see a further adjustment in the time frame or because you are assuming everything's I already wrote it in the bid specs that <laughs> handle it like it is, cost okay. it like it is. You know, I'm hoping that if it isn't, we're saving you okay. time and money in the okay. end. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome to stick around and learn about our teacher evaluation <laughs> plan, but uh, I think yeah. that's a better call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. We are moving on to our TEPL update with Dr. Carenti. Well, this is not much of a TEPL committee this evening. Um, I did send home all the people who are on the TEPL committee um, due to weather in upper state Connecticut. Um, so Mrs. Wallach was supposed to be presenting with me this evening, um, and unfortunately um, she can't be here, um, as well as there were several committee members that were going to join me this evening. So I'm a little bit lonely in the audience here, but that's okay. I think that I will do my best to move this presentation along and hopefully answer questions. And certainly uh, if there are questions that you would like to hear from teachers or building administrators at a later date, I'm happy to bring them back. So as you can see from the committee, um, it is made up of um, a variety of staff and administrators, and we certainly assure that we have representation from all buildings. Um, we've also combined our professional learning committee with our teacher evaluation and professional learning committee, um, mainly because we've moved off of process and we've really been pushing hard uh, for the last two years on the whole professional learning opportunities for teachers. Uh, for those of you that are new to the Board of Education, we began our research toward a new teacher evaluation model about six years ago. This was long before state mandates went into place. Um, from the beginning, we really wanted to develop a growth model that would help individuals, schools, and a district to grow. Um, when Connecticut proposed the SEED model, we were well prepared to ask uh, the Connecticut State Department of Education for a waiver that would allow us to utilize a different model completely. Um, and after lengthy communication uh, with the State Department of Education, we were granted that waiver. Um, and there are a few components of our plan that we must have in place because of state guidelines. However, a good majority of the plan allows us the flexibility to implement our plan as designed. Um, and yearly, we do have to submit to the state um, for permission to continue our waiver. There's probably about 10 to 12 districts in the state of Connecticut who are operating on a waiver. Um, many of the other districts in the state of Connecticut have just adopted the seed model, and then there are some that are working kind of in a hybrid mode, um, model. Um, but because we are completely different in how we operate, um, we're considered a waiver. Um, so this graphic is cyclical um, to show the continuous improvement of practice and student growth. Um, and really, every year begins with an initial growth conference between a teacher and an administrator. 
Um, and then throughout the course of that time period, teachers are really looking at longevity. They're looking at data over time in order to determine what they would like to establish as their professional growth plan. So teachers do pick, per, um, they look at our effective teaching framework, they look at areas that they'd like to grow upon, they look at their student data over time, and they select an area that they're gonna concentrate in, and they develop a professional growth plan around that area. Between the beginning of the year and their mid-year reflection, which is usually between January and February, it's an opportunity for administrators to observe teachers. Um, it's an opportunity for teachers to look at their data, continue to explore their instructional practice, and to make decisions about what they're doing for their students. It's also an opportunity for teachers to meet together um, in professional learning communities to have conversations about their professional growth plans, to participate in webinars, to participate reading books together, and even to observe each other's practice. Um, and we've really been encouraging teachers to go into each other's classrooms and offer feedback. So you might have a teacher who's working in one area like questioning, and you might have a colleague that goes in and helps to script their lessons and then gives them some feedback on the types of questions that they're asking their students using the depth of knowledge. Um, so we've really moved into a growth model where teachers are taking not only information from their administrators, but information from their colleagues. Um, they then have an opportunity to reflect on how their plan is going and how their students are growing throughout the course of the year. Um, they continue in this same cycle from our mid-year to our summative. In the summative, they're writing an evaluation, they're submitting it to their administrators, their administrators are not only meeting with them but also giving written feedback at that time. And it's really interesting because what we've discovered is really at the end of the year, growth conference is often the time that they're thinking about their goal for next year. So I, they may be saying, well, I feel like I've really done a nice job with my questioning, but now I'm ready to move into feedback to my students. Um, and this is why I think I have the data to move into that area. So they're oftentimes making um, decisions about where they might go next at the end of the year. As we developed our growth model, both the teachers and the administrators really wanted more opportunities for feedback. That came out loud and clear from all the teachers that sat within the committee, and that was certainly something that the administrators felt very strongly. So we've created that in multiple ways. We have growth conferences, mini observations, and comprehensive observations. So I've already explained a growth conference, but you should be aware that an administrator would be meeting with a teacher three to four times per year to just talk about their professional growth plan and how their students are doing within their classroom. In addition to that, the administrators are also going in and doing mini observations. So they might be going into a classroom for 10 to 15 minutes, and then they're providing feedback to the teacher, um, just a snapshot of what they saw, maybe what indicator they may have saw, what questions they might have about what's happening within that classroom. What's really fascinating, which the teachers enjoy the most, is that observations don't always need to occur in a classroom. So many of our teachers also sit in PPTs, they sit in department meetings, they lead professional development, so it's a great opportunity for teachers to receive feedback in those areas as well. They also have an opportunity to do comprehensive observations. If you're a non-tenured teacher, part of the state requirement is that you do have comprehensive observations, which means that an administrator's going in and sitting for a full class and giving feedback to that teacher. So what are they seeing at the beginning of the lesson, middle, and the end of the lesson? If you're a tenured teacher, um, they have a little bit more of a choice. Um, they might choose just to have many observations or they might choose to have a combination. So it's not unusual for our tenured teachers to choose that combination model. Oftentimes they're working on a particular area with their craft and they really want specific feedback. So they'll ask the administrator to come in and do a comprehensive evaluation and give them that specific feedback that they're looking for and then continue to provide other feedback through those mini observations. It's probably important to note that most of our administrators are probably observing about 25 certified staff. Um, that doesn't include non-certified staff, and that certainly doesn't include principals who would be observing APs as well. 
Um, also, one of the things that we're very excited about was last year we did introduce an electronic platform. So about three years ago when the State Department of Ed um, moved to the seed model, they had suggested that everybody move to Bloomboard. Um, and as we investigated Bloomboard, we really discovered that this was not going to give us any flexibility with the forms that we developed or the model that we developed. So we held for a year without an electronic platform and really did our research. Um, and as we began to do our research, there was one company that emerged and that's called Talent Ed. And what's so great about Talent Ed is that we create the forms that we want the teachers to utilize, what we want the administrators to utilize. And we have flexibility to go in and make changes all the time. So we're not using something that's been pre-formatted. It's really our own grown forms. And that's been wonderful. For example, last year when we rolled out Talent Ed, the feedback that we were getting from the administrators and from the teachers was really talking about um, a way to increase the feedback that goes back and forth between staff members and an administrator. So we just created a form and we created a feedback loop that allows administrators to electronically give feedback, teachers can comment to the feedback, and it can go back and forth a couple times. Obviously, if it's something that somebody really needs to talk face to face, that would also be part of the feedback. They might write a note that just says, love to sit and have a conference with you so that we can get into more details. So there's choices that they make throughout the, their process. Um, at the heart of our plan is our effective teaching framework. Um, and as you can see from here, there are six domains with um, 34 indicators. The domains speak to all the areas of which teachers are evaluated. And the indicators really allow um, us to emphasize areas of strength within each of those domains and then areas of growth within each of those domains. Um, we created our own teaching framework. Um, we didn't adopt a framework. We really worked hard as a committee to make sure that we created language that we were all accustomed to utilizing and certainly um, rigor within our framework. I think what's most fascinating, and, and we get calls from districts all the time, is that we've created frameworks not only just for the teachers, but we've also created frameworks for occupational therapists, physical therapists, psychologists, social workers, guidance counselors, and speech and language therapists. Because they are slightly different in what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, they also have different national standards, and we wanted them to receive feedback about their practice and have it be meaningful just like teachers. This is just an example of one indicator and what it looks like within our effective teaching framework. Our effective teaching framework is approximately 100 pages, um, but this is something, um, this is our learning objective and expectation um, in the responsive teaching classroom, it's domain number three. Um, so you can see that part of the state requirements is that we operate on a four point rubric. Um, so when we were creating our framework, we needed to create it on a four-point rubric. And what's really wonderful about this is when, as you read through it, it's the common language. So it allows everybody to be speaking the same language. It allows the administrators and the teachers to all have this common dialogue and common language. It allows department chairs or coordinators that are coaching teachers to have common language. So it's really been um, a wonderful tool. There are also four components to our teacher evaluation professional learning. I've given you a lot of details about the educator observation of practice, um, but there's also student growth, whole school student learning, and learning community growth. Um, the, the first two areas are the two areas that are weighted more heavily. Um, so teachers are always receiving feedback about their observation of practice, but they're also encouraged to be very reflective about their observation of practice as well and to self-reflect and determine what areas they would like to continue to grow in. Student growth, that's at the heart of what we do. Um, we're very fortunate because we don't rely on standardized assessments um, for our student growth model. We really are looking at our district assessments. We're looking at formative assessments. It can be qualitative or quantitative. Um, and it's really fascinating because the teachers who've really taken on the qualitative piece have kind of developed their own little checklist and rubrics um, that help them to really measure that student growth piece. 
Um, and then the next two areas are not weighted as heavily, but certainly a big part of what we do, and that's our whole school student learning goal and our learning community growth. And that's really the contribution to the school community. Um, and I think you'll recall when the East students were here and they talked a lot about that learning community growth goal and areas that they were focusing on as um, a staff as well as, on, as students. Um, a whole school student learning goal might be on higher order thinking, where they're really looking at depth of knowledge and really looking at the types of um, questions, types of assessments, types of formative assignments that they're giving to students as well. So we did um, one of the areas that the state of Connecticut would not budge on um, was that we needed to have a four level rubric um, at a summative evaluation. Um, and one of the things that we were fortunate about was that we didn't have to go with an algorithm. So um, we didn't have to make a calculation. What we used instead were decision rules. Um, so we're able to have a little bit more flexibility, but they did want us to have a four level rubric um, for each of our components. We had to provide descriptive feedback to the educators. Um, and really that feedback is, is at the root of what we do. So it was important for us. And this just is an example of the summative evaluation rubric um, that the teachers and the administrators sit down together to have conversations about um, when it comes to the summative evaluation. And uh, here's an example of our matrix that we utilize when we're creating our overall uh, rating for teachers. So this was really a struggle for us as a committee because we felt as a growth model, we didn't want to have one overall rating for our teachers. Um, and we fought really hard. Unfortunately, we didn't win. Um, but it was one of those decisions that they allowed us to move to decision rules versus an algorithm. Um, so we accepted the compromise. Um, if we didn't accept the compromise, they were going to basically take our scores anyway. Um, so this made uh, logical sense that we should be having conversations with educators about uh, their performance and their rating. And I think the teachers were appreciative of that as well. I'm not going to go into lengthy details, but I think it's important for uh, you all to read, realize that we also have a leader evaluation in professional learning as well, and that's called LEPL. And so when we submit our TEPL, we also submit approval for our LEPL. So all of the administrators are also evaluated, and what we felt was really important as a committee was that the LEPL and the TEPL look very similar to one another. Um, and that they are all um, under domains and there are indicators. It allows an administrator to pick areas that they would like to grow in. Um, they too write professional growth plans. They too get observations. Um, administrators meet with Brian, Darlene, or I, depending on the role that they play within the district. And then the assistant principals report directly to the principals within their buildings. So similar to the TEPL, there's also the four components of the LEPL. So we have an extensive leader evaluation framework that we follow, um, and we also have four components at the summative evaluation that we meet with and talk with administrators about. Um, the two areas, the leadership observation and the student learning, are the two that are weighted more heavily. And then certainly the other two areas, what looked very similar to TEPL, are the learning community growth and the whole school learning focus. Um, so really, we're proud of the um, model that we have in place here. It really supports the guiding principles that we established um, many years ago when we began our research. There was a committee of us that met um, for extensive period of time did our research, really establish what we wanted for our guiding principles, and we really hold true to those guiding principles. Um, we continue to meet as a TEPL committee. Uh, we usually meet um, about once a month. We bring the committee together. We talk about um, where we're going for professional growth. We're constantly talking about our plan and determining if there's areas that we need to improve upon or areas that we need to tweak. 
Um, it's really important as we move into May that we come together and, and receive feedback from all stakeholders to see if there's any adjustments that we need to make with our plan, because it's usually around the middle of May in which we'll submit our plan um, for state approval again. So for the most part, our plan has been pretty consistent, um, although there's been times where we might tweak a word here or there, um, and, but yet um, that's usually done as a committee. Those are decisions that we make together as a committee, and that's what we um, put forth to the state. So how do we know that we're working? Um, it's important for us to look at our evidence of impact. Um, so certainly, I think one of the areas um, just recently when we applied for the waiver and they granted the waiver, they um, said that all the communities who are on the waiver would be submitting another report to the state Connecticut Department of Ed, and that was due around February. So we really had an opportunity to come together as a committee and really analyze our plan. They gave us some areas that they wanted us to focus upon. I think that the state has been actively involved in our plan. They've always um, been very interested in what we're doing. Um, so we did submit um, a report to the state of Connecticut and just here are some excerpts from that report just to give you an understanding of how we really go back and to determine the evidence of impact of our plan. Um, certainly I think one of the things that we all notice is that teachers have really improved in their analysis of data and the use of their data for instruction. And that's really been evidenced in mid-year conferences and end-of-the-year conferences, as well as day-to-day -day practice. I think we all feel really strongly about our observation op options. I think we feel that they're very rigorous, that there's a lot of frequency, that it provides intentional, specific feedback um, to the teachers. Um, and we receive a lot of um, positives for that feedback that we give. I think one of the things that we introduced this year, which has been really uh, terrific, is we have these professional learning hours that are before school and after school. Um, and there are about 10 per year that the teachers do. And this year, we decided that we were going to create study groups. So the teachers um, are grouped by grade levels. They're across grade levels and disciplines, but they're grouped by the indicator that they're studying for their professional growth plan. So if I'm studying feedback, I might be an art teacher at the high school, but I might be working with a science teacher, I might be working with a math teacher, um, and we're having conversations about feedback and what it looks like in our discipline. Um, so the teachers get to come together, they're reading books, they're reading articles, they're participating in webinars, um, and like I said, in some cases, they're going in and observing each other's practices and giving feedback to one another. Um, one of the other areas is, you know, we've always noted some challenges. Our teachers have really high standards for themselves. And one of the areas that has been of concern is the amount of writing. Um, they like to put a lot of information into the documents that they submit. Um, and that becomes quite timely for them. So we've really done a lot of professional development for the teachers. Um, really bringing it back to what is the rubric, what's the rubric asking of them. Um, those are the kinds of things that no, need to go into writing. You still have an opportunity to bring all your artifacts, to bring your data analysis, and to really have a rich conversation with your administrator, and that you don't need to put every single detail into writing, um, that you're not writing an essay for a college, you're writing a summary of how you performed. Um, and so we've really worked on that and we've, we've really seen um, that benefit them. Um, we want their time to be spent wisely and that's really important to us. And then what's really important is um, the calibration. <coughs> so because we're on a waiver, um, we tend to use, we use a consultant who's been state certified. He's been approved by the state of Connecticut as someone who can work with districts to help with calibration. So as administrators, we actually go through a little assessment every single year. Um, we might watch a video together and then be asked to score independently um, and then have a conversation about how close are we when we're scoring that and what were might have been areas that we've been discrepant in. Um, we've been working with a consultant on our coaching model, on how we provide feedback to teachers, um, both in writing and orally. 
And just this past year, we've really expanded that level of work into work with our coordinators and our reading, writing, and math specialists. Um, and he's been spending um, some time with them on coaching and what does it mean to coach one of your colleagues. Um, so that's it. <laughs> I'm available to answer questions. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Crenty. I think um, I'd like to start by saying, for especially for the new board members, how modest um, you're being about the importance of this um, TEPL framework. And you know, I, I've talked to uh, administrators in other districts and how um, difficult working under the seed model has been and that I know a lot of people call you and, and others in the district to uh, you know, get information about how that's working and, and, and how much um, forethought was put in because it took a long time before the mandate came down for this district to you know, put together that framework so that we were able to get the waiver and, and um, it just speaks to the quality of the administrative team and, and everyone in the district that was able to work together to put this together so that we're able to have something that really works for our district and our teachers and is, and is really helpful in evaluating how to move forward. So um, can I open it up to questions? Anybody have questions? Brendan? Uh, just, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the caseload per administrator, you said 25 teachers. Is that reasonable? Is it unreasonable? Is that kind of workable in light of the framework that you have? I think the electronic platform has really helped the administrators to manage the workload better. Um, and I think the feedback loop that we created this year has helped the administrators as well. Um, I think. They um, enjoy being instructional leaders. They enjoy getting into the classrooms. That's where they love being, is around kids. Um, so to be in those opportunities to provide feedback to teachers um, has been really helpful. Um, similar to the teachers, we also work with the administrators on the amount of writing that they do um, for all of their summative and mid-year write-ups, because non-tenured teachers also get mid-year write-ups as well as end-of-the-year write-ups. Um, but. Okay. It seems to be working, but we continue to evaluate it every year, and we continue to have conversations with the administrators about the workload and are there ways that we can make it better. Right, thanks. Okay, Hazel. I just want to compliment you also about how wonderful it is to have that almost an onion effect of having everything so related and uh, the reinforcement that different groups give to each other is so important, I think, in teaching, and particularly to be able to have the skills of going in to help a colleague to analyze a particular lesson is a unique, uh, per, a unique thing to be happening in education. I had a question to ask. Do we do anything for the long-term subs? Because sometimes there are subs that are here for a long time because of a uh, variety of reasons. So if they are a long-term sub and they are here for an entire year, they actually go through our process. Mm -hmm. um, if they are a new teacher to the district and need to go through team, they still go through our po process, but the professional growth plan is team. Mm -hmm. So they work toward their team paper that they need to complete for the state of Connecticut um, to continue with their certification in the state of Connecticut. Um, and, but they still go through the student growth piece and the observation of practice and the whole school learning and the student learning growth. So if they are a long-term substitute and they're here for a full year, we do implement the plan. If they are not here for a full year, um, they don't necessarily need to do the paperwork, but the administrators are going in and doing observations and providing feedback. And then we certainly use our coordinators and our uh, reading, writing, and math specialists to also work with those long-term substitutes to make sure that they understand the cur curriculum and how to implement it. That's wonderful. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. <laughs> um, so just to understand with the, the seed program, so most of the rest of the, the state aside for those few schools that have the waivers do the seed. Just, could you just overview just of what's the difference between the seed and how what we do it and what seed stands for? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I cannot remember the acronym and what exactly it stands for right now. It's escaping me. Um, That's okay. It was in case. But I do, um, it's very different in the sense that they create what they call 
um, SLOs, which are student learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. They create a number of SLOs. Um, they tend to use a different model for how they evaluate their student growth. Um, and it all goes back to whether they achieve that SLO or not. Um, they do have an opportunity to go through the observation of practice, um, similar to us. Um, their scoring is slightly different, so they might be scored on every observation that's completed. Um, we don't score after observations. Our uh, opportunity is really for a growth model, so it's conversation and, and giving feedback to teachers. And then there is also the algorithm that occurs where they'll calculate out a percentage of how much they meet towards student growth, observation of practice. There's a, um, a formula that's utilized. It's like 45% goes towards this, 40% goes through this, 10% goes to something else, and 5% goes to something else. So just a different format that they utilize. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining, because that the kind system. of really shows why our, our system's better when you can get a more of a, a, a total evaluation, right? Just so that you know, SEED stands for System for Education, Educator Evaluation and Development. Thank you, Mrs. Pianca. Thank you. So um, the other question is, I know we talk about administrators and with the roles and having to do this. What levels of administration are, are um, doing the, the evaluations? Is it just at the high levels, or are we talking about the math coordinators and such, too? Or who, who does all these programs, or what part of their jobs? So uh, the people who are administrators have to have the certification of O92 to serve in the evaluation and supervision capacity. Um, so right now at the building level, the people that have those certifications and serve in that capacity are all of the building principals as well as the assistant principals. And then we're fortunate because we have the special education coordinators like the Marianne DeFelice and Carol Pacala who help out in their department. Alan Sneath and Lizette D'Amico help out in their department. Matthew Salvestrini um, helps out in his department. So the department chairs, many of them have their O92s, but they don't service um, in that supervision and evaluation. They serve as coaches and mentors to teachers. Some of our coordinators have O92s, but once again, they serve in a similar capacity. Okay, great, thanks. And so um, going be aware of my questions here. Um, you know, you're saying that the teachers have gotten much better at doing the data analysis and, and, and um, using the information for instruction. What kind of data are they looking at? What, what types of um, information have they been able to analyze better? So it could be anything from a formative assessment to a unit assessment to a benchmark assessment. Um, that they'll be giving students. Um, so sometimes it's a day-to-day -day that they're using for their formative assessments. Sometimes it's a writing rubric that they're utilizing. Um, they um, have unit assessments. They have benchmark assessments at the middle school and high school. In 7 through 12, you'll hear more midterm assessments and final exams. Um, mm -hmm. But throughout that time period, they're using many different checkpoints um, to help measure and monitor that student growth. Um, and they've become quite for even creative, even with the feedback. So if they're looking at feedback and they want to analyze how they're giving feedback um, to their students, I believe Mr. Stevenson was here a couple of summers ago, and he even talked about Google and giving feedback mm -hmm. through Google and getting that immediate feedback and how the kids respond to that immediate feedback. And so one question goes, I mean, it's wonderful that you're doing all these study groups and being able to have the students, the teachers relate at different grade levels and kind of see what's happening. Do the teachers have enough time to do, or is this able to get all the scheduling in, or you know, is it done on professional days? Um, is that a challenge for you to, you know, because it is so important, I think, you know, to this aspect of teaching because the, it improves the quality of what they're doing in the classroom. Right, so as a, a district, we have our professional learning days, and um, those occur for a full day. We have one um, this Friday, and the teachers are very excited about the upcoming professional development that they have planned for this Friday. The professional learning hours are um, just an hour, so if they're an East or West teacher, they tend to meet before school because they have a later start time, and if they're, um, South or Saks or the high school, they meet for an hour after school. Um, and that's in addition to department meetings or faculty meetings. And there's only about 10 sessions per year that they meet. But they meet so much more frequently um, as departments and as grade level teams um, throughout the course of the year. It's, it's not unusual to find them meeting at least once a week for either professional learning communities or meeting as a grade level um, uh, to talk about 
the curriculum, to talk about assessment, to talk about implementation. So. And one last question. Um, as you're looking at these teachers and you know the growth uh, portfolios that they're doing, do you also look at overall um, subject areas and stuff, of trends of, you know, if it seems that across the board there is something that's not quite right that you might want to bring in more professional, you know, a development, which, you know, you'd come back to us and say, like, you know, we'd like to do this or, you know, have more money appropriated for this or... And that's, that's part of all of our calibration training. Okay. Um, so that's part of the work that we do. So it's now that we have um, an electronic platform, it's easy for the administrators to look at it and to analyze the data overall. It's easy for us to look at it um, at a district level as well to try to help target specific areas for teachers as well. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Maria? I know the state um, model kind of had, I think it was 45% for mm -hmm. student data, 40% for observation. What do you mean by decision rules and no algorithm? Like, is there a percentage that you allocate for um, test scores versus observation, or does it change by teacher? Nope. So when you look at the decision rules, the way that it works is um, the... Page 11. Uh, the teachers, thank you. Page 11, I think, Jill, but it only has a one. Right, so we're missing one of the categories the there. So the teachers will receive a rating in student growth. So they're either going to be below standard developing, accomplished, or exemplary based on the criteria that's been listed there. They'll receive a rating in whole school student learning. They'll receive a rating in educator observation of practice. And the one indicator that I just couldn't squeeze into this page mm. was the learning community growth. So then if you turn the page, what happens is you're taking a look at the educator observation of practice and the learning community growth. Those two get merged together. If you look at the next slide where it's talking about the reporting matrix. Um, Am I saying that? So if you look at the reporting matrix, oh. so and then the student outcome rating. Um, so there's the student growth and the whole school learning. So that gives one score, and you kind of bring it together as a, a matrix. So if you received um, developing and your observation of practice and learning community growth, um, and you received um, accomplished in the other area, you'd bring it across, and, and it actually works to the teacher's advantage of ending in accomplished. So the decision rules actually work a little bit in their advantage. And then if you read through the top piece, it just kind of talks a little bit about how we come to those decision rules. So um, if you're student growth and your whole school learning and there's more than a discrepancy there, then you go with the heavier weighted of the student observation. Sounds like complicated. <laughs> <laughs> But good. I mean, I, I, think, I think the algorithm would be more complicated. Yeah, well, I, I think New Canaan had foresight when the seed model first came out because um, the practice and the observation seems to be, in my opinion, more important because that's, you know, where you're working with students, where the test, there's a lot of variables in a score. So I think that's good. How do you think, um, I know, I think this is like the third year of the state using this evaluation, and I thought I saw something come out uh, that just came out recently about how districts uh, scored teachers in general. Do you, did you find that New Canaan scored, or did you see that? How did we do? You know, I think it's challenging in the sense that um, it's hard to do a comparison to people that are using different, different effective teaching frameworks. So there's some districts who have adopted um, Danielson. There's some teachers that uh, districts that have adopted the Connecticut model. You know, we have our own framework, and I'd like to think that our framework is very rigorous, um, and we have very high standards for how we want our teachers to perform. Um, so I think it's hard for us to always do a comparison when you're looking at those kinds of numbers. What's more important is the growth model. So you know, if a teacher ends on developing, then what are we going to do to help that teacher move to accomplished? If a teacher ends on accomplished, how are we helping that teacher to move to exemplary? If a teacher continues to live in exemplary, how do we help that teacher to continue to grow? We have many teachers in our district here who are exemplary. And those actually bring more challenges about how you help those teachers to continue to go grow and, and be reflective and um, to continue to um, improve in their practice as well. 
Any other questions? Can I say something real sure. quick before I go? Yeah. I just I want to just take a very brief moment to thank Jill for uh, leading this <laughs> Temple Committee um, along with Chris. You know, you mentioned it just now, and I was waiting for it to come out. I mean, the the frameworks that New Canaan has put together are extremely rigorous frameworks. And if you take a look, all of this is available on our website, and I invite every, everyone to take a look and click through those. Uh, the continuum of practice, that's what we use when we go into classrooms, when teachers establish their goals. And really, it was a committee of the whole. It was subcommittees. It went back and forth. It was a very thoughtful, reflective, and iterative process putting these together, where uh, it, I think the end results truly speak to the high standards of, of performance we have for our teachers, which results in the outcomes that we see with our students. And I think the state, the fact that the after we started this and started implementing it, it was all of the other sort of non-classroom professional folks that Jill mentioned that most of with, which are in Darlene's uh, department, they came and said, what about us? You know, we want this too because we see it, we like it, we think it's a good model. Most districts that have adopted SEED just sort of plugged it in for their, their non-teaching staff and nobody really complained much about it. Here they said, no, no, we want this too. And I think that's really a strong testament to the efficacy of this work and how it is driving change for our teachers. The, you know, it really does change the vocabulary. It really does um, make the conversation about instructional practice and about things that are replicable. You know, there's so much great work going on in so many places, but now that we can talk about it and describe it to each other, we can replicate it in, across the district in, in ways that we couldn't do before. The study groups that Jill briefly mentioned, I think really are another testament to kind of our continued implementation of this as we go from the sort of the knowledge coming from the administrator as the evaluator to the teacher. Now what we're looking to do and what's happening throughout the year is teachers are, as they're talking about this with each other, they're adopting the language and they're becoming more conversant with the, the instructional practices and the things that all exist in the, in the continuums, which then again brings it more and more alive in practice. So it really is about shifting the ownership and having the teachers understanding it, using it in, in really pretty amazing ways. And as you said, we have so many exemplary teachers in our district and now we have language to explain just why are they exemplary and then how do we replicate that and across our district you know, for the benefit of all of our kids. It's really, it is very important and exciting work. Um, and there's a lot, always a lot left to do, but it is this continuous improvement model. So I, I do also want to give the same caution about sort of trying to compare one against the other, uh, because we are, the, the standards that we've created in these frameworks are really high standards and meant to be just that. Uh, exemplary is an aspiration, you know, as we're going through, as we're working on this. And it's a very tough place to be. Um, and we have teachers that get there every year, which is amazing. And what a wonderful place for us as a district to be where we're not just talking about, well, if someone's not quite performing where we want them to be, how are we going to help them? We're talking about how do we help our superstars get even better as well. And that's, I think, the quality of the work and it speaks to the quality of the, the people who are leading these efforts. So thank you, Joe. Is there any risk of not getting a waiver, do you think? or? Right, are we operating under a waiver every year, the waiver of the seed? Um, I can't imagine that they would right. not grant us the waiver. Mm -hmm. um, we have spent um, a lot of time communicating. Uh, I, I know them personally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've visited with them. We've invited them down. We've met with them. Um, Brian receives communication from them constantly. Um, the TEPL committee is in communication with them. Um, I think it would be very difficult for us not to be granted the waiver, but obviously um, that, you know, we make sure that the certain things that they want us to make sure are in our plan are there. Um, so, you know, there, anytime that the state is recommending that we need to make a slight change, um, so there might be something that has to do with a disagreement. So somebody disagrees with the rating that they received, what's the process? Well, the state's pretty clear about that process. So it's a matter of saying, okay, so we're gonna just take that process and make sure it's part of our plan because that's something that we can all agree upon. Um, what we wanna make sure that we really keep sacred to is the framework that we've created and our observation practice um, and all of that, that, that's really the heart of our plan. And I would just 
add on to that. I think the fact that the state asks us for copies of our continuums of practice, and not just for the teachers, but all of the ones that we've developed, and they're asking us questions about them and what's working, what's not. I think that, um, and certainly with some of the changes with the new commissioner and a slightly different approach, um, they're looking at ways that they can bring some more flexibility into their plan. So I think that uh, they see us as uh, partners in some of that, where we can maybe help them to develop things, to share with them our experience so that whatever changes they make will be effective. I think that's a good sign. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we are moving into the action item section of the agenda, and it's hard to believe that the action item for tonight is the uh, motion to approve June 15th, 2016, as the graduation date for New Canaan High School, with a rain date of June 16th. Um, do I have a motion, Sherry? And a second, Sangeeta? Any discussion? for the graduation, but if the graduation is on 15th, does that mean the last day of school is the same day or after the next day? No, so the, um, <laughs> I'll be quick, but the, by policy, by April 15th, the Board of Ed has to establish a graduation date. What we typically have done is, when, when possible, and it's not always possible because in a couple of years we had to reduce our school year from 182 to 180 because of snow and other things, but this year it's possible. And, <laughs> It's possible <laughs> uh, because actually Connecticut doesn't allow you to establish the graduation date until after April 1st. But once you've established it after April 1st, if your calendar changes due to weather or other factors, you can stick with that graduation date. So that's good news. Uh, the Board of Ed policy is that we do it by the 15th. So we're right in that window. What we have done traditionally is set the graduation date for the 181st day. So we adjust the senior schedule a little bit so that their exams are complete and then they'll have a rehearsal, they'll have the graduation. Then the seniors do not come back on 182nd day, unless they want to, and they don't. <laughs> really? <laughs> but the rest of the students will be finishing up whatever they're doing at the various levels in different schools. So it does give us that rain date because we still do graduate outside, as you know, on Dunning Field. And it is, to me, it's just a spectacular experience for our graduates and it's something we we want to protect. So having that extra day helps us to do that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, may I have um, a show of hands of those who moved or approved the uh, motion? Any, any, uh, anyone against? Okay, motion passes. So June 15th with a rain date of June 16th for everybody, anybody watching. Um, Moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Hazel? Second? Jen? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Consent agenda passes. Uh, comments from the public? I don't see any public, so I will move. <laughs> I will. Uh, <laughs> I will move on to announcements and future business. Dr. Lutze. Sure. Very briefly, our next meeting is April 18th, which is the Monday after our spring break. As you know, we have uh, three days of school remaining this week, and the four, uh, fourth day on Friday, our staff will be in for our professional learning, uh, where there are different department-specific <coughs> opportunities for folks, and it, we're pulling the building administrators together as well to do some work. So the, on that Monday evening, we will have an update on our X to one program that was recently implemented at the high school with our ninth graders. Uh, and Dr. Keating will be sharing with us the next statement of accounts. Okay. All right. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn to executive session? Sherry, second. Brendan, all those in favor? Any opposed? All right, so moved. Adjourned.